So um, we there, hopefully we're looking for comments and questions. Uh, one of the things that's been important to me, um, I remember at a meeting uh, uh, introducing myself to Adrian because she gave a talk about cultural ecosystem services. Um, a lot of states have had pushback against oyster aquaculture, and personally I have seen very few skeptics convinced because of the water quality improvement or the habitat improvement provided by shellfish. I believe in it, I think those are important things, but I'm not sure that they've won many town meetings over. I think this is a critical topic for shellfish farmers to be thinking about. The cultural ecosystem services provided by your operations, I think, are vastly outweigh the environmental benefits and have a chance of convincing um, members of the public that what we're doing is important to their community. So I hope um, you guys will pay attention to this. I know ecosystem services sounds a little out there, um, but I think this is actually really critical to the industry. So Adrian. All right, thank you, Bill. I'm gonna try to take this over here. Um, and thank you, everyone. So like Bill said, cultural ecosystem services is a bit of a, a clunky phrase to think about. But hopefully at least some of the folks are familiar. Um, many Oyster South members contributed to this research. And if you caught the succinct seminar series last year in lieu of the in-person event, um, you caught sort of a snippet. And so I'm going to be talking about cultural services that were sort of founded in research, but this won't be a typical research talk. And if you are looking at the agenda, you have me for 45 minutes. So I really <laughs> hope that people discuss, because otherwise it's going to be real long up here. Um, but so I'm talking about cultural ecosystem services, which are essentially the, the social benefits that oyster aquaculture can provide. And so for me, that translates to social impact. And so for anyone that's tried to permit their farm, if you're not already in an oyster aquaculture park, chances are they had to do an environmental assessment. Part of that is to think about the impact on the human environment, which includes this social impact. And thus far, it's pretty data limited when we think about it. It's more of a, well, we don't, we don't think it will have a negative impact, and you know that's kind of that. But it would be great if we could actually say, this is the positive impact that we have. And so that's sort of where my research lies, in thinking about those positive impacts on the community level, the individual level, and thinking about these cultural benefits. So today with the discussion, thinking about the social impact of aquaculture, thinking about the role that everyone within the Oyster South community could play in thinking about it. So, not only through research, but thinking policy and management and the industry broadly. So not, again, not just farmers, but everyone that's part of this community and thinking about down the line how oyster aquaculture is potentially impacting. And thinking about who we're trying to sell oyster aquaculture to, who needs to hear about these benefits, and what's the best way to get at that, what's the best way to share. And so I'm going to ask you to pull out your phones again. This is a, a Mentimeter talk, um, and so I'll have Mentimeter going through just to have a couple of polls throughout, but using it to frame the discussion. So I also have um, Victoria Pruenti has offered to take notes for me, so I'm hoping that this discussion doesn't end here in this session, but that this will lead into some continued work thinking about the social impact. Um, and so just to make sure if everyone can't see, so you're going to menti.com again, and the code for this session is 69912851. And I'll give a little bit more time for everyone to get on. You should get a, a little screen that just says instructions. Um, but so we'll be talking about the social impact and hopefully I'd like to hear from everyone what sort of benefits have been selling points for you. So what do you think are the most compelling ones? What ones do we need more information about? And who are we trying to talk to about these social and cultural benefits? And so again, the code will be up at the top for anyone that hasn't quite connected. But we're going to start with a first little poll. So which of these are oyster-related ecosystem services? And so just to make sure that we're all sort of on the same page or at least the same chapter when it comes to ecosystem services, uh, we have a couple examples. You can pick one. You can pick all. But so we have habitat for other species, a delicious source of protein, enhanced water clarity, or the continuation of a fishing community identity. And so I'll give some time for everyone to enter. And it looks like we have habitat for other species and water clarity in the lead so far, but still have a good number of, of folks that have put the protein and community identity. And I'll admit it's a bit of a trick question. They're all examples of ecosystem services. And so we'll move on here. We have examples of what these ecosystem service categories are. And so when we're talking about the sort of bigger, clunkier framework, 
We have provisioning services, and so this is just the, the food that you're providing. So oysters as a food product, shell that might get used for recycling into restoration programs, wherever that shell ends up. The regulating services, so the regulation of ecosystem processes, filtering the water, um, providing habitat that flanks shorelines. And so we know that oyster reefs are good for doing this, but oyster farms are also. So your gear is helping to protect adjacent shorelines. The supporting services, so that is habitat, providing this sort of foundation for the system and providing refuge for other species. And then finally, my favorites, the cultural services. And like Bill said, I think we need to keep talking about the environmental benefits. Those are obviously important and good selling points. But I think not talking about the cultural, we're doing sort of a, a slight to the industry by not emphasizing some of the good benefits that we could talk about. And so today, I'm going to do just briefly introduce these cultural services, but mostly going through some examples from the work that, that I've done um, in my research. And so, the way that I talk about cultural ecosystem services is using a definition that's a little bit different from the typical one. Typically, it's just the non-material benefits, which is pretty open, pretty broad, and makes it so it's hard to really understand and capture. I think about it as the interaction between a cultural practice, like farming oysters, in an environmental space, for example, the Deer Island Oyster Park right out here. And so through that interaction, you produce cultural benefits. And these benefits take shape as identities, so identities that are created through work with shellfish, experiences that are enhanced through work with shellfish, and then capabilities that are strengthened or created through work with shellfish. And so that's sort of how my, my dissertation work was framed. And again, not a true research talk. This is my entire method slide here. But just to give you an idea how I came about this list and, and thinking about the research. So essentially, I had a two-year road trip where I traveled the Atlantic and Gulf Coast and was working with oyster growers, with scientists, extension agents, commercial fishermen in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Maryland, Virginia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida. And so it ended up being just over 300 folks participated in this research project. I worked with them out on their farms, on their boats. I did interviews and did a final online survey to produce, ultimately, a nice peer-reviewed publication in marine policy that Bill's a co-author on, as well as Don Webster and Jen Chaffer. But so we have this publication that lists the cultural benefits, which ended up being 46 total benefits that the majority were cultural, but not all, so there were still some of those environmental benefits mentioned. But with here, and I should add that, so this, I don't intend you to read this list, but if you're looking on your phone, you can see some of the images that will come through today a little bit clearer, um, potentially. But so with this list, we have a list of the benefits, but this is probably not the best way to share and not the most accessible way to really you know, disseminate this information. So thinking about other ways to do that, today I'll be giving examples of the benefits, not the entire list again, um, but would happy to share, be happy to share that PDF if anyone's interested in the paper. But talking about photos, and for anyone that recognizes the video, you're welcome for having this in your head the rest of the day. Um, but so part of these interviews that I did, I did standard interviews, just question and answer with folks, but I also did photo voice interviews. And so for photo voice, the idea is that a, a picture is worth a thousand words. And so asking people to think about these benefits, think about what you like about your work, what's some of the best things about your work, and come back with a photo. And so I met with people that shared three to five photos that really captured the benefits that they got from their work. And these included oyster farmers, it included research scientists, um, it included some gear manufacturers, so people that were supporting shell fisheries in various ways. But so today I'm going to go through some of these photos to provide examples. And you'll see, at least I think they're a little bit more accessible than a you know, printed out list of benefits. And so for the first example, this is a benefit that I identify as the novel occupational identity. But you can see when you hear from the oyster farmer, um, it's a little more interesting, a little more engaging. And I'll add, so some of the participants didn't want their names associated with quotes, so I haven't identified anyone by name. But if you want to claim your photos, and some are more recognizable than others, um, feel, feel free to do so. But so, thinking about oyster farming as a novel occupation. And so here we have one of our farmers 
who identified as being sort of a rock star, creating this celebrity status. And a lot of people talked about that. So, so for example, you go out to a bar, someone asks what you do. They want to know more when you say you're an oyster farmer, which isn't the case necessarily for all jobs. And so this identity came up multiple times in interviews. It was, it was pretty common. We also have another identity of being a caretaker. And so the fact that you're growing this animal from maybe larvae to seed or seed to market-sized oyster provides a sort of animal husbandry that people, people appreciated. They valued that identity as caring for the animals. But there was also usually something else about it. So for this person that worked in a hatchery, it was the fact that they were raising these seed up for someone else so that it was going out to farmers and they were supporting the industry in that way. We also had people that were proud of getting their oyster from seed to sale. So this is someone, very first harvest, got it to market, very excited. And this is also someone, I do want to identify the farmers here. So this is Dottie Lolly, and the photo was taken by Bet Betty Kuhlman. Um, and so you know that we lost Dottie and Betty last year, and I practiced this so I wouldn't get choked up. Um, and I would just want to use it, one, because I think it's, it's right to acknowledge their loss, but also they highlight the next benefit that I want to talk about. So with Dottie and Betty, they were extremely welcoming when I came to them. And so they wanted to show me the farm, show me Alabama, show me all about the industry. And it was the same with other students that have come and done research. They've hosted multiple projects on their farm and we're just really happy to connect. And this ties into the next benefit, which is all about those relationships, the relationships formed. And so the way I talk about it in my research is calling it social capital. And so people are building relationships. There's this sense of camaraderie. And sorry if I'm blocking the folks over here. I'll move around a little more. Um, but so a sense of camaraderie within the industry. And so not only are you connecting with your coworkers, your fellow farmers, but the customers that you're selling your oysters to, maybe the chefs that you're talking with about your oysters, and just sort of the general public who, who's interesting. So that person at the bar that wants to know, wait, oyster farming, what? So just being able to share that and building these relationships. And so a lot of the benefits were at the individual level. And in the discussion later, I challenged to think about how we can take some of these individual benefits and sell them more broadly. And so why, why does the community care that, you know, the individual oyster farmer feels good about their work? And so thinking about transitioning that to a bigger level. But I also think there's plenty of community benefits that need attention. And so here we have another farmer who talked about sort of the legacy involved in farming oysters. And so for a lot of people, this is part of a family heritage. And so maybe it's a heritage of working the water. Maybe it's a heritage of working specifically with oysters. It's connecting people to a place. So it provides sense of place. It's tying to a cultural identity, a community identity, and a family identity. And then, so for this one, this is where I want you to get out your phones again. Um, we have a, a Mentimeter poll. And so for this, this is a photo that was submitted by a Maryland oyster farmer. And I have a couple examples of what it could represent. And there's plenty more that it, it could also, but limited it to five. And you can pick one, you can pick all of them. But so we have cultural heritage, family heritage, security, knowledge, and skills. And so I'll give you a couple um, seconds to, to plug those in. But so we have examples of identities again, so identities based in cultural and family heritage. We have a sense of security, so this is one of those experiences, and then knowledge and skills, which are the capabilities that, that are formed. And I think it could represent all of them, which is why I put these examples. But for this farmer, this is actually part of a multi-generational waterman family. And so this young man is the grandson of a waterman, his dad is a waterman, but father and son, well, grandfather and father, I guess, um, they didn't want him to become a waterman because they didn't see that as a reliable option for him. They didn't think that, you know, 20, maybe even 10 years down the road that he'd be able to make a consistent income, but they thought that oyster farming could provide that. So that was part of the reason why they started farming oysters because they felt better passing down that legacy instead of traditional water work. And I have another one for you all to, to think about. And so this one will be a word cloud. So it's sort of open to your interpretation of what benefits you think it shows. And full disclosure on this one, it's actually not about oysters. It's about clams. But so this was someone who submitted a photo who is both a clam farmer and a wholesaler in Cedar Key. 
And I think this one gets at um, the community side of things. And so here we have, let's see, security getting big again, more dough, economic, resilience. Oh, this is kind of fun how quick they change. Um, and I appreciate that everyone's quick at entering. I was worried this would, would slow things down too. But, and so it's hard to see. Let me see if I can, I wonder if that goes bigger. No, just hides it. Um, but so it looks like the larger ones are success, income, security. And I'll save this so that we can share this afterwards to see all the smaller. Um, and so with this person, when they were talking about it, it was sort of their own economic gain that this was, you know, they're a clam farmer. So when they sell their clams and they get paid, that feels good. They're paying their bills. But they also buy clams from other farmers. And so they're able to do that same thing for others. And so providing that for the community to help sort of spread the wealth and, and have that input. So it's providing economic input at two different levels, the individual and the community. And then I just have... Two more examples before we open it up to discussion. Um, and it looks like we still have a good chunk of time left for discussion. And so with this one, remember I said that most of the benefits that were mentioned were cultural in nature, but not entirely. And we often see an overlap in the different benefits. So they're rarely standalone. So that's why it makes it even harder to try to pinpoint single benefits. But here we have somebody that gets to benefit sort of from a, a recreational standpoint. They, they, get pleasure out of going to fish around their gear. But the reason why they're able to fish is because that gear is providing habitat and refuge for those other species, so providing prey items for these uh, speckled trout or spotted trout. And so we have the provisioning service if these fish are being eaten. We have the supporting service providing habitat and refuge, and then we have the cultural service, which is just the sort of the, the pleasure gained out of it. And then, one more before the discussion starts. Um, so another thing, so again, integrating multiple benefits. So for this person, they talked about the farm to table approach. And so this goes to the provisioning service where we're producing a food item. And for many people, it wasn't as, as simple as just I'm producing food for people. It's I'm producing local food. I'm producing sustainable food, healthy food, safe food. So there's all these other sort of cultural connotations tied into it. And so those are just a few examples, um, and I'm happy to, to talk about more, but what I really was hoping to get at today is talking with the group to see sort of what benefits you think that we really need to focus on, who we need to tell them to, like who we need to direct this to, and how to go about that. And so I have this broken up with a couple of more examples, but wanted to start with this first question and using Mentimeter to sort of frame the discussion if folks would rather enter it on there than raise their hand, but also just opening it up to everybody to, to take part and talk about it. So are there certain benefits that you think are sort of unrecognized or underappreciated that we need to be selling more? Are there some that we need more research on? Are there some that have worked particularly well for you? So maybe you found that by telling someone about, you know, benefit A, that really changed their mind and, and helped move things forward. So um, we'll take questions or, or comments from, from anyone who's willing to share. Here we go. So I live in a, a county in Matthews that has the most waterfront per, per acre of land of any county in the Chesapeake watershed, basically. So the, the heritage there is all about water boat building and watermen in particular. And um, I'm, it's also got significant contribution in aquaculture. It's got two of the m major East Coast hatcheries located in this little tiny county. The, what I'm astounded by is how little people in this ostensibly waterfront area know about aquaculture, period. Never mind about oyster culture, but certainly about, you know, the process of aquaculture. So the, the public, which is the people that we're reaching out to, are kind of more naive than we think. That's my impression that I get. I do, so thanks, Dan. I do agree. I think that there is, and even sort of within folks who know aquaculture, I think there's, there's the need for more understanding. And so maybe that's one way of thinking about different education and outreach that we can 
can integrate this in to make sure that not only are we we're talking about what's good, but just in general, what, what is aquaculture? I think that's a good point. Um, it's hard to sell things. It's hard to emphasize the good if we don't have sort of the baseline of what it is. Adrian, I have a question. Um, where we farm is called Oyster Bay for a reason, right? Because all these oyster bars are out there, but they're non-productive oyster bars. And so the ecosystem services and services writ large like you're talking about existed before those bars essentially went dormant. What do you think the relationship is between uh, restoration aquaculture and the original aquaculture ecosystem services that existed because of the natural bars? Can you riff on that? So I think in thinking about how restoration aquaculture and, and natural reefs and ecosystem services, I think there's been a lot of work to show that farmed oysters can provide the same and or similar services. And so I think being able to emphasize that, even though they're getting harvested and removed from the water, still, you know. Oh, I meant more in terms of the cultural <laughs> kinds of aspects of the question, like, you know, tongers and and you know that was a whole cultural right. thing right and and it was contributory to the oysters that we think about from Apalachicola now so so that that is one culture and and now this is a slightly different culture right okay and, okay and that's what I'm all right now I, I'm with you so I did I have worked a lot with commercial fishermen and one of my other sort of research questions was looking at that transition um, from wild to farmed in terms of a livelihood and the actual job and just in terms of perceptions of what what was being lost for those that thought something was being lost and I think it's important to, it's not a one-for-one one in terms of that cultural component and so one of the one of the things that I did with these benefits was ask folks which ones were enhanced or diminished through work with aquaculture and it sort of was all over the board depending on one's perspective of what they thought for the most part aquaculture could provide the same cultural benefits even if slightly different, but there were two specifically that folks talked about as being diminished. And one was the, the thrill of the hunt. So like a, a tonger is not gonna get the same sort of satisfaction out of farming oysters. If, if they're hunting for their oysters, then they may not be the best farmer. Um, but so there, it's certainly, the, there's the potential to sort of lose that. And I think the expectation that every commercial fisherman can take on aquaculture or wants to take on aquaculture is not, it's not sort of feasible just because it is a different mindset, um, different way of working. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm interested in developing the Louisiana oyster industry and I'm also the marketer for the shell elevator, which is a, a gear for raising mm -hmm. oysters. And so from our point of view, what we're trying to do is to get more, as many people as possible, involved in oyster culture. And in Louisiana, people have homes and camps all around where oysters can be grown. And so one of the things that we're doing is targeting those kinds of people to help them, produce, help them learn to produce some type of oyster, they may not be able to produce an oyster that will go directly to the food market, but they can produce seed, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm thinking that the more people that are involved with it, the better we are gonna be in terms of our environment and in terms of our oyster industry. I look at it as if, you know, like people raise chickens in their backyard. People should be raising oysters on their dock. And so the more people we can get that doing that, the better I will be, right. <laughs> but also the better the industry will be in producing oysters. So thank you. Well, and I think that gets to, like Stan's comment earlier, that sort of spreads awareness also that could be beneficial and, and you know, people might listen to their neighbor more than they would listen to an outsider coming in to tell them that oysters are fantastic. Yeah, uh, Chris Nelson with Bon Secours Fisheries, and um, I'm in the seafood business, and right now the seafood industry, uh, at least in North America, is trying to recapture the position that we all thought we would have by now, which is 
the being the nutritious food, that nutrition based on omega-3 fatty acids and what we sell, that we would have that space because it, we should own it, but we don't. And there's a push right now to try to do that. Back in the 80s, that was discovered to be something important for health, particularly your heart health. And I, it, there, there's another aspect to this that goes with that, and it has to do with what's the uh, impact on climate change or human-induced climate change from growing food or harvesting food, for that matter. Uh, and aquaculture and seafood come out at the top of both of those lists or near the top. And I think that's what the public needs to be made aware of, is the fact that not only are you supporting something that is often family-based, like a lot of other farming is, so they get a warm fuzzy with that, but they can also eat something that's the best thing they could possibly put in their body. If, you, if you're going to eat an animal protein, and um, it's you know it's good for the environment. So I don't I don't know how why that's been so hard to sell. I mean, as I say it, I'm going like, well, why are people not beating my door down to buy seafood? Uh, if they knew, if everyone knew this, they would be, and the old rising tide lifting all our boats would be noticed by everyone, including the oyster farming industry. So that's what I got. No, I think that's a great point, and I have two sort of follow-ups, which I'm not going to say are the sort of end-all solutions or answers to this, but I do think, it, you know, going back to awareness, and there's been, especially during the pandemic, a lot of effort to, you know, here's how you can cook oysters at home, and, and you know, so people learn more about how to prepare it, but thinking those markets that are the non-traditional markets. So I'm, I'm from the Detroit area. When I go home and bring oysters, maybe 10% of my family is willing to, to try them. And like each time, you know, one more person might try it um, and win more over. But I think there is just the sort of that cultural aversion for some folks. And I also think with oysters, it also becomes a, a, an accessibility question too. And thinking of like, as we're promoting aquaculture as a, a safe and healthy protein source, can everybody get it? Um, and so thinking about some of those questions, too, when we're talking about, how, like, how to better market. Hi, I'm Al Winner with the uh, Tallahassee Community College, Wakulla Environment Institute. We've had our oyster aquaculture program now going on about 10 years. We're in our 10th year coming up. So the one thing that we've seen is that at the beginning or the onset of this, it was difficult to get people to transition to the mindset of what aquaculture means because they had a negative connotation associated with it. Right, so mm -hmm. um, getting that traditional farmer or traditional tonger to understand now you have to do farming was, um, and it still is difficult, but now that through years we've had things in our community like the Oyster Festival going on several years now, and it's being a law to draw economically for the particular area, and then you see all these different businesses pop up because of aquaculture. It's, um, people are now starting to get the message, but Patients had to be a part of that. But what we've seen, though, out of all of this is that you have to really pinpoint what people's culturally, what they're looking at. So in Indian River Lagoon, we're looking there because to them, the number one thing is the manatees because of water quality. Mm -hmm. So they're interested in aquaculture from that standpoint. When the pandemic came around, it was because oysters are our number one food source for zinc. And that was huge. So if we can get that type of message out to people, and what we found out, that people resonate different ways, but they resonate with it. We just have to be able to find that, you know, be able to find that linkage with them. Right, a bit of a know your audience sort of approach, which I think if it's okay, we'll transition to the next. So there are, oh, Soup, do you want to have one more? Well, I'd like to temper some enthusiasm in the room with a reminder to us all, and I don't think it needs even stated, but oysters, clams, mussels are the most regulated food in America. And it's because you eat them raw and you eat them whole and they concentrate everything they filter in the water. So we've got to be careful about smart growth. 
because one way to put a damper on all your marketing is for people to get sick and it hits the press and Chris Nelson can attest to all those horror stories. Recalls. God. Okay. So let's keep all that in mind that as we educate the public on the value of doing all this, there's a smart way of doing it and a right way of doing it instead of just having workshops all over the place, mm -hmm. getting everybody into it, regardless of the market condition that can occur with all that hopeful glut of right. monsters. But you, don't, you want people doing this right. And there's a reason why, you know, we have our state sampling hundreds of places every month, water samples to test if there's fecal coliforms in the water and all that. So smart growth isn't the point I was making there. So. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So thinking back to that sort of more education and outreach, I guess, and how not only talking about the good, but making sure it's done properly. And so there's a lot of um, benefits that are listed on here. And... Just in the interest of time, I won't go through all of these right now, but I will go through and sort of summarize and, and share that later. Um, the next sort of prompt I have here is, so this is an example from Wellfleet, so not from the South. And this person was actually talking about the, the level of control he had over his farm. So his benefit was that he goes out there, he's working on his own, nobody's bothering him, his farms are nice and ordered, or his rows are nice and ordered, and he goes and does his thing. But there's something buried in here that I think comes back to the, the conversation today. And so the not a lot of mansion or not a lot of pushback from the folks with mansions. So we don't all have mansions flanking the riverside or the bay. But this gets back to who who we're trying to reach. And so that's what I'm curious from the group here, who do we think we need to to emphasize our efforts? And obviously we want everyone to know that oyster aquaculture is great, but who are the sort of key people and is there anyone, you know, that if you've had examples where there was a particular member of the community, whether it was the mayor or, you know, a town planner, that that's who needed the convincing and once you turned that mind, things were, were easier. And so this one will be the word cloud so you can add stuff, but again, opening it up for discussion if anyone has, has thoughts on that. So it looks like we've got... Um, Policy and regulators, state legislators, consumers, waterfront homeowners, property developers, um, community leaders seems to be running a little bit bigger than the others. Uh, the general public, waterfront homes, and I. This also might tie into a little bit of thinking about how we go about some of the, you know, permitting whether parks are are helping alleviate some of this. But oh, yeah, Andy, go ahead. Yeah, what I found is the most important people are the ones closest to you, your neighbors. So when I started my farm, it was personal consumption under my peer, and I made sure all the peers on either side of me had, you know, baskets and oyster seed, and they started growing them. And then it metastasized. Dottie was one of the early adopters, and she was very influential. And we planted seeds in uh, Portersville Bay and, and Fort Morgan. And you know, one of John Supan's neighbors now is growing oysters. So it cannot be more organic than the people who live on the water. And not all of them want to grow 100,000 oysters. But you know, there's an opportunity for them to grow seed. And some of them are now you know, growing oysters to a certain size and turning them over to another professional company that goes out and harvests and markets and moves them to a higher salinity area. So, you know, look close to the, I found that it's a lot more influential to the people you know the best. Okay, great. So thinking about the sort of bottom-up approach to, to spreading the word. Hey, good morning. Andy Kane from Florida. So, I think if you want to move the needle and change the perspective of the public, um, I don't think, like for example, in this community of people attending Oyster South, we're all sort of on the same page. You don't have to push really hard here. I think that the majority of our country does not relish, savor, and go out of their way to eat oysters. So that's, that's really part of, I think, where we're focusing on. And oysters represent this iconic animal that's been around since, what, 
Pleistocene era. I mean, it's been around for in the fossil record. It seems to live through everything, but in recent days it's different, and we have aquaculture now because we're meeting a market need. But I think that Oyster South, if you'll all agree, is a great ambassador for oyster aquaculture. But that to extend that from a cultural standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, um, each of us are ambassadors for oysters. And if we're going to be ambassadors for oysters and growing darn great, delicious little oysters, why not let that oyster be an advocate for oysters in general? That we're not just considering the cultural ecosystem services provided by oysters in culture, but that these are animals that are cultured and these are animals that grow naturally and there's very big differences in their abundance and what we have control over, but that as overall ambassadors, as an icon, as a product that we can farm, I'm not sure that we want to detach the reality of the value of the oyster in that. And maybe we can all therefore use our oysters and our farming and our amazing products as advocates for the bigger picture also. Thank you, Andy. Hey, uh, uh, Adrian, I'll, I'll, because I've got the mic, I can do this. I, I, I'll add, like, um, to put Andy's uh, point also about, like, the people, the homeowners, and, and the slide that you had before would mention the mansions that are above the water that are looking down. So I'm just curious, for growers that have gone to meetings and had their permits protested, um, I think it is probably those nearby landowners that are looking out on, they're the ones that are motivated enough and have the money for lawyers that show up at those meetings. And I get that you need to be friendly with those people and you need to convince them, but I would challenge this crowd to think about who in that community we're not convincing that we would like to be motivated enough to show up to be there to counter that. Because I would argue it is really hard to convince somebody that's got a house looking over the water that thinks they bought the view. I can talk about all the economic benefits. I can talk about all the water quality benefits. I can do all that. I am not changing the fact that they don't like the view. Okay, so I would argue I need other people at that meeting. I need people that live a couple blocks off the water to be motivated enough to go there. And so maybe that's economics, maybe it's environment. To me, um, I don't want to put Florida on the spot, but I look at Cedar Key, Florida, that could adopted clam farming, and I look at that town, that is a town where you go in and that is a part of the culture. It, everyone knows it's jobs there, but it is a part of the culture. At Christmas time, they have a clam in lights, right? Leslie, is that true, right? It is, you know, um, the hardware store, Santa clam. We have Santa clam. Um, the mayor is a clam farmer. The, um, the hardware store has a sign like hammers, nails, clam nets. Like, it's not just that it's economics. It's part of the culture. And if you were the homeowner that went into a meeting, tell me if I'm wrong, Leslie, if you went into a meeting and talked down clam aquaculture, I bet you'd feel pretty awkward in, in Cedar Key. Is that right, Leslie? It, They're homeowners, they pay taxes, and when we go to commission meetings and, and planning uh, meetings, we're able to show, again, that their folks are making a living, and we actually then also have the economic impact that shows what the local hardware store is doing as well. And I really do think those implant studies are very important to go along with the value of the industry. And actually, that is a good connection to the next, oh no, sorry, I have two down, and I think I'm gonna skip ahead just in the interest of time. But so, wanted to also talk about how to go about sharing that information, and since we're down to five minutes, I'll just throw this out there and see um, what comes after. But um, also, sort of tying into what we were just talking about with Cedar Key, I have my own example in Panacea, and so I think folks recognize crumbs if you're from there. But when I walked into Panacea to get something, they asked if I was an oyster farmer when I walked into this store. And so I think that's starting to get to, you know, where Cedar Key is, it's recognized, their community with clam farmers, that oyster farming is now a recognized identity. It's also not an identity that's accessible for women, um, which isn't necessarily the case for working the water in other places. And so I think getting at trying to quantify that and think about how we can, we can illustrate that beyond, you know, telling a story that somebody asked me if I was a clam farmer or an oyster farmer. Um, but, so I'll leave that there and again open up and so thinking about who we're reaching and how to do it. Go ahead, Michael. 
No, I think it's uh, kind of a tie-in with what I was going to say. So I, I think most of us realize that if um, those that live in coastal areas, if all we saw was the path from where you live to the beach and the traffic, you'd never go to the beach. You have to see the beach, right? And that's what we need to be doing. So a, a great example of that is my next door neighbors had no problem with me getting permits and me putting it in. They knew the environmental advantages and the economic advantages and they were all for it. The day after the trap showed up, I got a phone call. They wanted me to buy their property. They, <laughs> they did not like the way it looked at all. Now they own an RV park next to me and I'm just down the street from John a little ways and I'll tell you that within three weeks, what we started noticing was every person in the RV park was sitting on the shoreline watching us work that, that farm and they wanted to talk to us. And once they realized that there was an advantage to them, they were okay with it suddenly. So everybody has to, to me, has to touch it and see it. John, you've had open houses at your place and invited folks in. Yeah, and we've done the same thing. Uh, we actually had uh, school teachers lining up, Boy Scouts that wanted to come out. We've had people offer to come work it when we're up and running. So I think if you can, if you can find a way to let people touch it, they're in. And the more people that touch it, the more people that are in, the more people you have that are going to be there to be positive and to back you. It can also be the answer to teenage crime in America. Put them to work. <laughs> yeah, thank you for letting me uh, speak again. I'm in Louisiana, and so I'm mostly, cons I'm trying to draw the connection between storm protection and aquaculture and oyster farming. And to me, that is a major problem that we have in Louisiana because people don't understand how you need to rebuild the coast in order to protect the coast. And the same, that same action can also enhance the areas where oysters are grown. And so I think that's how we need to be talking to people not only at the, at the water level, we need to be talking at the governor's level. This is a development uh, situation, and in Louisiana, we're blowing it. Yeah, and I guess my follow-up to that would be then thinking about what, what's the best way to have those conversations? What data and what shape would that be to, to illustrate that? And so I'll leave this up for a little bit longer. Um, we're getting close. But happy to talk more if anyone is interested, because I think this is certainly, as a, from a research standpoint, this is not a question I can answer on my own. That's not feasible. But if anyone's interested in discussing this sort of thing or maybe thinking about with your business how we can talk about social impact, I'd be happy to talk more. I just, uh, can we get a round of applause for Adrienne? She was... Uh... Adrienne, she, you know, she downplayed that two years of living in a, in a van and going around the country and working with oyster farmers. But